OBC Kibbutz Program Manager. I've been with OBC for many, many years. And I'm very proud and honored to say that I've also been a volunteer on a kibbutz, not just once, but twice. Um, it really is and was a very, very special time of my, of my life. I have absolutely no regrets. And one of the reasons why I'm here today is probably because of the program. So I find the kibbutz program a really hard thing to put into words, to describe. Um, in a good way, just purely because I find that um, it is such an experience, it's, it's an experience that you really have to experience for yourself. Um, it really is, I found Israel full of magic, full of um, awesomeness, um, and it really is some, a country that I feel is definitely underrated. Um, so for those of you who, um, who, who don't know, uh, let me just quickly go to my next slide. Uh, for those of you who don't know or can't really uh, remember in terms of where Israel is located, um, it's obviously located in the Middle East. We've got it's surrounded by the Mediterranean. Um, it is also surrounded by Egypt. Um, we've got Jordan and there's Syria and there's Lebanon. And um, Whilst I would say, you know, people, people ask all the time, like, uh, uh, Israel, so isn't that like um, where there's lots of war happening and lots of bombs going off and is it safe? So I can honestly tell you with my hand on my heart and let you know that it is 100% safe. Um, OBC and our partners would never send you to a location or to a, a country where uh, anything um, where you would become, you know, something would, would happen to you. Um, so obviously, like any country, there are troublesome areas. You just obviously have to stay clear of them. And quite interesting to note, I did read one day that Israel is probably about the size of the Kruger National Park. So just to kind of give you some kind of South African context. So whilst it might be very tiny, um, it certainly has a lot to offer. So remember, don't um, don't uh, uh, don't just think, oh, you know, it's tiny. There's nothing there. I think it will definitely surprise you. Um, and the other biggest question that we get is pretty much, what is a kibbutz? Um, you know, it's such a foreign word. Well, it obviously is a foreign word. It is the word does come from Hebrew, um, so it's a Hebrew word or meaning uh, the word group. Um, and pretty much, a kibbutz is a type of settlement that is unique to Israel. So you're not gonna find it anywhere else in the world. Um, and pretty much people who live and work on a kibbutz are called kibbutzniks, and they work for the greater benefits of the community. Um, and as a volunteer, you are gonna be volunteering your time and your muscle, um, and in exchange to be a part of this community where you can obviously immerse into the Israeli culture, you can learn a lot about Israel, and not only Israel, there's a whole lot of volunteers that come from different parts of the world that you'll be meeting whilst you're on a kibbutz. Just in terms of um, our partner, I'm um, very, uh, we, I think OVC is very blessed to, to be uh, partnered up with KPC. We've been partnered up with them since forever, um, and I think every year our partnership grows from strength to strength. Um, they are very, um, they're a small company, but I, I think in many ways they are very much um, uh, uh, really there for the volunteers. Um, they are uh, based in Tel Aviv, um, and uh, there's uh, a couple of ladies in the office that will obviously meet and greet you when you arrive. They are the ones that are going to be handling the placement. Um, so your actual kibbutz placement actually gets done when you arrive in Tel Aviv. So a lot of people think that they are able to get placed beforehand, but that isn't the case, and we'll chat about that now. Um, and they are also responsible for screening the kibbutz location. So they um, make sure that the kibbutzes that the volunteers go to are, um, are you know, safe um, and that the, the volunteers have all the necessary requirements that, that they need to. Um, they also give you an orientation and a guiding for KPC. Um, you know, they will be able to tell you what areas your, the kibbutz is located in, maybe things that you can see, maybe things that you can do, etc. Um, and then there's also your kibbutz volunteer leader on the kibbutz 
So uh, that person is responsible for looking after all the, the volunteers whilst you're on the kibbutz. And then, of course, you've obviously got your, um, your, your friends, your, your other, your fellow volunteers that really become like your family when you're on that side. Um, but whilst we're on this slide, I think it's quite a nice time to actually just bring our partners online. So we are lucky enough to actually have both of the ladies who work at the office with us, uh, Karen and Moore. Um, and I've asked them to come online and just answer a couple of questions that we get asked quite a lot. Um, so let me just quickly see if I can um, get the audio on um, and then we can ask them a few questions. Hi, Mo. I wonder. Uh, Mo, we can't hear you. So I think maybe your audio isn't connected. Uh, is Karen here? Are you there's Karen? I'm going to unmute Karen. Karen, can you hear us? Yes. Hi, Hi Amanda. Hi. Hi. Thank you. So Thank you so much for coming online. Uh, more uh, uh, shame then. I know that you, you're very shy. You don't want to be in front of the cameras. So <laughs> and now we can't hear you. Um, uh, so just uh, thank you so much for coming online. I just wanted to ask you a few questions that I had for you. Um, in terms of the kind of questions that, that, that we get, I wanted to ask um, why, um, could you maybe just explain to people uh, why, uh, maybe a little bit of a background of the actual kibbutzim. Okay, okay, great. Thank you, Amanda, first for inviting me. i um, very happy to be here a bit about uh, the kibbutzim, the, the kibbutzim movement and the program itself. So first, maybe just a small background. Of course, the, the kibbutzim, as you said, are a very unique um, type of, of settlement or village that started uh, that started last century, like in the beginning of the 20th century. A lot of uh, young people from Europe came to Israel in order to, uh, to, to start and to, and to build up uh, this small country called Israel and to build it up as a, as, a, um, as a country also for Jewish people. And they came with this, uh, with this Zionist ideas, but also very socialist ideas that were back then in Europe uh, very common. And they started, they wanted to start a community which would be very, uh, very much about uh, 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 social living, about uh, democratic living, about a way of equality, of, of trying to promote that for themselves and for the and for everybody. Uh, the kibbutzim, like the first kibbutz was uh, established 1909 and ever since we have now about 250 kibbutzim all around Israel. And, uh, and they played a very important role in the history of the establishment of Israel in economic sense, in the defense sense, in a lot of ways. And, uh, and in the beginning, in the, um, after Israel was, was founded, there were many, many young people from all around the world, uh, that, uh, especially from Europe, but not only from all around the world, that came to Israel and wanted to be part of those kibbutz, that wanted to, to help the young country and to help those kibbutzim that were fascinated by these ideas of, of, a, of a small village that is completely democratic, that is completely socialist, that is completely all about uh, working as a group. And uh, we had about 12,000 volunteers, international volunteers each year. Uh, at about the 80s, 90s, uh, uh, the kibbutzim Israel started changing, the kibbutzim started changing, and there were, there were processes of privatization and processes that went and changed the, and the kibbutz from within. And, uh, and the kibbutzim stopped taking so many volunteers. They didn't need any more, volu like any more uh, volunteers in those numbers, and they were also changing from within. Uh, so the, the numbers have dropped. And, and now in the last, in the last uh, 10 years, I would say, uh, something amazing is happening in the kibbutz again. They are, they are redefining themselves, uh, finding their social living in a different way, not, not only as like still collectives, but in different ways, also putting a lot of uh, emphasis also on the individual, not, uh, 
like there is a different balance between the individual and the community. Each kibbutz in its own way. We have uh, at least, we have from those 250 kibbutzim, about 30, 40 kibbutzim that are still really, really communal. Uh, and the others are more, are more privatized in their own way. And they started asking more and more for, young, uh, for volunteers from abroad because of this understanding that people, young people from abroad bring something else to the community. And having those groups of international groups in the community is something that also the kibbutzim in their collective memories remember that as something which is uh, amazing in the kibbutz. And they wanted to bring it back. And we wanted to bring it back in something in a way that will be suitable for our day. So uh, we have about 30 kibbutzim that are, that, that are receiving volunteers nowadays, not in the same uh, huge groups that they used to be. Some kibbutzim are bigger than others. Some of them, for example, I live in a kibbutz called Gezel, which is uh, um, it's very centered in Israel. And it's a very small kibbutz. We have 200 uh, members with 350 people that live here with children and everybody. And, um, and there are kibbutzim with 2,000 members. So they're very, very different kibbutzim. Uh, for example, my kibbutz doesn't have any more agriculture that we do ourselves. So we are not receiving, we don't have capacity to receive volunteers, but there are there are still a lot of kibbutzim that do have agriculture work, that do have uh, industries, that have also still uh, kitchens and, and, uh, and um, uh, dining rooms for all the members. So those are the type of works that are still existing. And, uh, and we see our, in our uh, pedagogical view, in the way that we understand this program today, is we would like to to enable young people to come to Israel and to get to know the Israeli society through getting to know a community, through being a part of a community, which is much more than being a tourist. It's a different, it's a different way of getting to know a society when you live within it, when you actually have the opportunity to meet Israelis in your age, others, and so on, but also be in an international community. Uh, this dialogue between those themes enables many wonderful things to happen. Uh, it's also not very, it's not just, uh, it's, it's a process that is also uh, demanding. It's not always easy to confront uh, ourselves and to confront uh, things that we learn about others and about ourselves, but uh, it helps us grow. In a, in a wonderful way. And I'm saying that also, Amanda, I was uh, just to, I don't know if you know that, but I was, uh, uh, when I was 22, I moved to Germany and I lived there for 10 years. So I'm also saying that from my own experience of what living abroad for a while actually brings you and what it develops in you. So I think it's an amazing opportunity. And, uh, and we would, we try to, to, to facilitate that. Now we are, like when we say we, we are the KPC, it's, it's actually, um, we are a department within, which is not a big department, there, there it's true, but we're a department in a very big organization called the Kibbutzim Movement. And the Kibbutzim Movement is an NGO, it's not a company, it's an NGO that actually is the roof organization of all the kibbutzim in Israel, of all the 250 kibbutzim in Israel, that tries and to, uh, to, also be an organ that helps them and unites the, the, the interests and the, and the needs of those community, but also promotes, um, also promotes the ideas that the kibbutzim believe in, in the Israeli society. We really believe that we have a place, we still have a, a role to play within the Israeli society. And, uh, and we try to, uh, to do all kinds of programs with all kinds of people. Our department is only one of, of, of many uh, that, that tries to, 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 to facilitate educational and also um, social work within the Israeli society. Um, our we have nowadays uh, at about 300 volunteers a year uh, from all over the world, really. I think we counted lately with more like about uh, 52 countries at least. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 
uh, we have a lot of South Africans coming to Israel uh, for a longer period of time because we really truly have a very a very good uh, relationship with the OVC and uh, and I think that makes a huge difference in the way of how uh, how we can facilitate this program in terms of, of also recruitment and expectations and preparation and so on and to to towards what happens when the volunteers are in Israel um yeah so this is for my end i think uh, more if she can uh, may, more maybe can add some more things about the, the the program i think you might have to chat a little bit more because i think more's um uh, her audio doesn't seem to be connected so she's uh she she's you've uh, she's like you've lucked out she's lucked in i'm afraid so <laughs> if i can ask you a couple of questions that we get asked quite often obviously i know the answers to this but for the benefit of the audience um one of the questions that we get asked quite a bit is is there such a thing as the best time to to be on a kibbutz or the best time of the year to be in israel um what what would you suggest if you when you ask that question okay so I think one of the um, advantages that we do have in our program is that it's a very flexible program that you can join in uh, at any time point for at least uh, at least three months. But then it's also it's a very flexible. People can then decide they want to stay longer, up to a year. So it's from three months up to a year. Very flexible um, to the needs and to the wishes of the of the of the volunteers of the of our participants. Uh, I would say that in order to have uh, the, the full experience to stay a year is amazing. If you can stay a year, a year is an amazing experience because something happens like also pedagogically and, and, uh, and process wise, something happens within a year when you stay a year that you go through all the phases and all the different things uh, of the, um, of this experience. Now, there is also an option uh, um, that till now it was less common, but this is something that we would like to build up more and more. Uh, the option to also, after three months uh, or more, to, to be able to change a kibbutz. If, if somebody was living in a kibbutz, say in the north of Israel, uh, and then they would like to see also the south of Israel, after a period of at least three months, but of course can be also more, uh, they can approach us and we do it, of course, with uh, uh, we, we talk about it also with the, the kibbutz coordinators and, and we facilitate, but, but we definitely would like to, uh, uh, to enable that. So the volunteers will be able to see more and to experience as much as possible. I would say that the most beautiful time in Israel is of course the the spring and the autumn because the and our spring i, I think in south africa it's different <laughs> yes, the, yes the month the opposite, but yeah. our, our, our spring time is exactly now from april from the beginning of april till uh, till end of june june of course is more of a summer but but it's like from the beginning of april till end of june it's a beautiful time it's very warm here but not extremely warm uh, everything is is bluing and so on. There is uh, from from May. There is no rain anymore in Israel, mostly. Uh, so it's always very good time to travel and see the country. Also, the also the autumn is a is a relatively warm time in Israel from September till uh, November, even sometimes end of November. November like end of November starts the the first uh, phase of rain. Uh, but also, you know, also the rain time, the winter time in Israel is quite mild. Um, I don't remember how it is in South Africa. I was in South Africa, but I don't remember how the winter is there. But here it's very mild. It's like uh, we have uh, uh, the temperatures, depending on where you are in Israel, but they move between, I would say, 10 degrees till uh, 18, 16 degrees, those are normal temperatures for the Israeli winter. Okay, yeah. I remember uh, Jerusalem being freezing, uh, <laughs> but then I do come from a part of, of South Africa that is quite hot. But I remember Jerusalem being uh, really cold in the morning, 
and it warmed up during the the day and then really warm in in the evenings i mean really cold in the evening so um i think that's you know people just also have to remember that obviously it's in a desert so um that that is obviously to be expected um and one other question you have before that, i let have that in, the, in the wet in the desert by the way as well you have like the, the 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 winter in the desert during the daytime it can be 18 20 degrees even sometimes but the problem is that it once the, the sun comes down, it can go down to zero. So you have like this huge temperature gap, which is very, um, uh, it's very hard. Yeah, yeah no, I remember that. Thankfully, I was just visiting and I wasn't actually working on a good book there. Another question that we get asked a lot is, um, can I, uh, uh, people are quite amazed or, or quite surprised, I should say, that they only get their placement when they arrive in Tel Aviv. I think they, they get quite anxious um, not knowing exactly where they're going to go. Um, so are people able to, um, you know, specify certain locations or kibbutzim or, or anything along those lines? So we have like the 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 way the program is run now. It is like that that they uh, that uh, the participants are coming, landing in Israel, coming to our office, and there are more. They meet more our wonderful Mo, mm -hmm. and uh, um, and she is doing an interview with with the participants, with the applicants, to understand from them, first of all, what are they interested in? What would they like to experience? What they like to do, like more the north, more the south? What is the, what is the, uh, uh, what would be their wish? And then we try to, uh, she, tr she more finds them the, the, the place through um, the right kibbutz, uh, from the kibbutzim where they have spots available at that moment. Now, I agree. I would like as well, and we have this discussion all the time in the office nowadays, um, I would like it to be done ahead of time. I would like them also to know where they're going to before they arrive. But then we must understand that uh, in order to, to, to do so, we would have to know when the volunteers are arriving, which uh, would be then less, uh, uh, less flexible for the for the, the volunteers themselves because as I said nowadays the, the advantage for the volunteers is that they can just say okay I would like to come then and leave there uh, if we would want to to try and do, do those matchings ahead of time then we would need to to have times of the year where volunteers can come to a certain amount of time it would be less flexible so those are the things that we are all the time trying to wave and to try and understand so what how can we do it better we still discuss it but this is the way that we do it at the moment and um, and we do try really our best to find the the right place for the right person also in terms of just you know sometimes it's uh, it's not just the place itself it's also Mo then understands like she already has so much experience so only from the interview she can already understand uh, what would be the right culture sort of like atmosphere the best atmosphere for the this specific person you know like they, they are, as i said different kibbutzim also have different culture different way of organizing different work and mo knows all of that in very very good detail so you know and we we would we really really want the volunteers to be happy in the place that they that they have or where they where they would stay in preferably a longer period of time no that's awesome and i have to agree more is uh, spectacular um she's um really um uh, outshone um her, herself so um uh when you do eventually arrive in tel aviv and you meet that lovely lady you're gonna have to all just give her a big hug for me because um mm -hmm. She has really, especially recently, she really has um, assisted us in, in, no end, in, in no end. So thank you so much, Karen. We will probably uh, call upon your, uh, some more, maybe some more questions later on in the presentation, but I really do appreciate both of you attending and for us to be able to kind of like put a face to a name. So I'm just gonna turn your camera off for now. Um, and I'm just gonna carry on with my little bit. Um, so thank you so much. Um, so that was uh, uh, Karen and, and Maul who were obviously chatting 
uh, from KPC. Um, if you have any questions for them, um, we can obviously ask them towards the end of the, the presentation. But um, what does it take to become a, a volunteer? So it's actually quite an easy eligibility. The window to be able to qualify is quite open and, and quite big. Essentially, you need to be between the ages of 18 to 35, uh, male or female. South African or European passport holder, you need to provide a medical certificate to show that you are physically and mentally well or healthy, as well as with that show an HIV certificate or a, a result. So it really is quite easy and quite straightforward. The whole process is very simple. It probably has to be one of the most simplest procedures to do within our, um, all of our, over all of our different programs. But I have to just say that personally from doing the program myself, I do feel that it takes a very special type of person to become a volunteer. And I don't think the program is definitely for absolutely everybody. You do have to make sure that you have the right expectation in terms of what you're going to be doing. You need to make sure that you know that you are going to be doing some kind of manual work. Um, you're going to, um, you, you, you are, going to be learning and, and doing jobs that you probably A, potentially have never done before, um, and, and B, that you could potentially not use in the future. But the reason why you would be volunteering is not because you want to further your career or anything along those lines. It's, it's like Karen said, it's, it's to gain, um, you know, you would be upskilling yourself, your personality, you'd be growing as a person. Um, but also really, I feel that it would be teaching you things about other people and it's a time to really reflect and to learn about yourself. So you would definitely need to have a lot of, um, well, not a lot, but you would need to have some kind of independence because at the end of the day, when you actually arrive in Tel Aviv, you have to get yourself from the airport and, and to the KPC office. And OBC are there and we give you the instructions and we go through a final briefing with you. And we will talk you through and walk you through, you know, getting from the airport to actually getting to the office. But you do have to have that kind of uh, independence. Um, you'd need to be somebody that is flexible and somebody that is responsible. You know, at the end of the day, you have a purpose. You are a volunteer. So, you know, this is not a game and, and this is not a um, it's something that, that you can do on the sideline. You've now committed for a certain time period. So you need to make sure that you, you know, you get up and you, you, um, you show, you turn up at work and you're on time. Um, you, might, you probably will need to find that you need to be flexible. Um, so you might be asked to do various different jobs throughout your time on the kibbutz itself. Um, you definitely, obviously, like I mentioned, would need to be fit and healthy um, for obvious reasons. The type of work that you're going to be doing is not really brain power, but it's more like muscle power. Um, you would need to definitely be someone that is interested and open to learning new cultures. Um, and I would have to say that whilst you don't really have to necessarily be outgoing, I do feel that you have to have, um, well, let me put it to you this way. If you are an introverted person and if you really don't like people, um, you are really going to struggle uh, probably being on a kibbutz. It's a very social environment. You are going to be sharing um, amenities. You're going to be sharing a room with someone. You're going to be sharing a bathroom with someone. You're going to be going to lunch and there's going to be like hundreds of people. Um, so you are always going to be, there's always going to be someone around you. So if you are going to be, if you're going to struggle with that, then it probably won't be the best program for you. So just to, just to keep that in mind, you don't have to be um, a, a, a major people's person, but you know, you do, and there will be loads of time for you to have your own quiet time, etc. But if you are really going to struggle with that, then um, just, just, to, just to think uh, twice about that. And what do you get out of the program? So um, it's really, uh, I like to call it what's almost like a safe place, a safe haven. Um, so your housing is all taken care of on the kibbutz. It's certainly not a hotel, so you are a volunteer. So I would definitely describe it as being very basic. There will be, um, uh, uh, you'll have a room which you'll probably share. It does vary from your kibbutz to kibbutz. Um, sometimes if you're lucky enough, you might find that you have an ensuite bathroom. If you're not so lucky, you might have to share the, the bathroom down the hall. Um, the, the kibbutz team, um, are all very different in terms of how they run, but they run like a very similar uh, a skeleton as it were. So a lot of them will give 
free trips. Um, some of them will give more than others, but that is a really nice benefit, especially if you don't have the funds of your own to be able to possibly travel after your program. You could possibly then use that opportunity to travel within your program. And like I mentioned just now, you're going to be gaining work experience like no other. Um, you might find that it fuels a passion for something else. Um, when I was a volunteer, uh, I worked in the kitchen. And yeah, it's not a very glamorous position, but I cannot tell you I loved, I, I loved being in the kitchen. I loved being with the food. Um, it really created a, a, a set something alight inside of me with regards to food. And I will always look at a kitchen now, not the dishes, obviously, but the prepping part with great excitement. Um, so it really is something that you can take away and, you know, always use later on in life or something, something along those lines. And the, speaking about food, obviously your meals are all included. Because a lot of the kibbutz do obviously have agriculture, a lot of it um, you'll find the fruits and the vegetables will literally be from farm to, uh, to, to table, which is phenomenal. So I personally have to say that I found the Israeli food to be amazing. Obviously, I love food, but it was just um, uh, absolutely amazing. I've, I've yet to meet uh, uh, someone who says that they didn't like the food at all. And also on the program, um, because it is a volunteer program, you'll be earning something that is called a stipend. So a stipend is just another name, an American name for pocket money. Um, so whilst it is, uh, you will be earning some kind of pocket money, just to keep in mind that this is not a money-making program. You're not going to go to Israel and, and work as a volunteer to earn tons of money. In fact, you will, you know, that money will be able to get you through maybe buy toiletries, a couple of drinks at the bar, um, that type of thing. But it's definitely not money that you're going to have to be able or going to be able to use for you to travel um, at a later date, just to keep that in mind. So if you do want to travel, then just take a little bit of extra spending money. Um, and then just in terms of a kibbutz and, and how it's run, um, most of them run pretty much the same way, but obviously bearing in mind that each kibbutz runs differently. Um, it things that work a little bit different in Israel. Um, their Sunday is like our Monday. Um, and on a kibbutz, you'll be working generally six days a week. Um, so most times you would maybe get like say half a Friday and Saturday off. That would be like our or your off day. Um, and you, depending on the kibbutz that you off, you might find that you get one weekend off a month or some kibbutz get two days off or three days off. Um, and you might then just chat to your volunteer leader in terms of when you would like to take that. Maybe you'd like to bank it this month and double it up the following month. Um, the, the volunteer leaders are generally quite flexible in terms of when you can take that as long as you give them um, a, a time or a, advance uh, notice. Um, and then just generally your daily routine. So um, when it says early rise, they generally do mean early rise. So you're looking at like five o'clock, six o'clock rise. Um, so nice and early um, to get uh, the brain working. Um, you would then go off to work, work for a couple of hours and you would have breakfast. Um, when you have breakfast, breakfast and lunch on a kibbutz I found was pretty much um, the main meal. So, um, you know, there was absolutely, it was almost like a, a buffet style. So there's no way that you'll, you'll actually go hungry. You'll have breakfast after that, you'll go back to work, then you'll pause for lunch and then go back to work. And then after that, you'll probably end about early afternoon and then it's your free time. And so really things to do um, on, a, on a kibbutz during your free time is, I know that we, there's generally a pool, um, so it's a really great time to work on your tan, and there's lots of time just to chill and relax. Um, there's normally a pub or a bar that is on the kibbutz for the evenings. It might only be open like a couple of times a week. Uh, once again, it just depends. Uh, there's normally like a, a space for the volunteers, like a volunteer lounge and a kitchen. Um, but it's really... Um, a, a different time of, of your life where you're going to be going into a safe space and whilst it does sound a little bit like Groundhog Day and a little bit monotonous, probably think, well, why would I want to do this? Where is the most amazing experience? And it really comes from what you make of it and obviously the other people that you meet. So on the slide, I actually just want to see if I can find, we have two past um, volunteers. We've got Morgan and Amy. Um, I'm going to ask Morgan to come online quickly because just because I have her slide first. Um, is she on here, I wonder? She was earlier. Let me have a look and see if I can find her. Oh, there you are. Okay, awesome. Let me unmute you. <laughs> hey, Morgan. Thank you so much for having me. 
it, thanks so much for being online. I really appreciate it. I just have to say to the audience, when I asked Morgan and, and Amy to um, do this, I mean, normally most people would be like, oh, you know, no, you kind of have, like, have to beg them. But the excitement was unbelievable. And I think that just kind of is testament to the, to the country, to the program um, in terms of, of what it's about. So, so, Morgan, if you could maybe just let us know what kibbutz were you on, how long were you on the kibbutz for, um, and why did you decide to do the kibbutz? How did you hear about it? So I went to Kibbutz Baram, which is in the north of Israel, right next to the Lebanon border, which was very interesting. Um, I was there from uh, August until early December. And when I first heard about the whole Kibbutz experience, I wasn't really excited about it. They didn't sound very life-changing. But then when I did more research and I saw photos and I spoke to one of my friends who actually went to Kibbutz Baram, and just the way he spoke about it, I knew there was something magical, as Amanda said earlier. Um, so I just decided to go for it. And it just seemed like a cool way to travel because you have the safe space of just being in a nice community and you're able to go travel around Israel. And Israel is such a unique country. So I feel like there's no experience I can really like compare to that. So I just decided to go for it and it turned out to be the best experience of my life. <laughs> That's awesome. And tell me, what does Kibbutz Baram, what, what do they, what, what are they known for? What do they do? How do they, they survive? So primarily they are, um, they produce apples. So they have lots of orchards and that's where the volunteers work as well. But they also specialize in making any plastic that's used in the medical field. Um, so some volunteers also work there in packaging that but they also had various businesses there. I can't even name all of them. They were <laughs> involved in many things. There was a very big kibbutz. So the volunteers could literally work in any industry that they wanted. That's awesome. And how many other volunteers were there? I mean, I know you were there for about four months. Is that right? Yes. And, so and on average, summer, what, what would you say? So in the summer, there was about 40. And then as it got colder near December, it dropped to about 30, maybe less than 30. But the maximum volunteers that they could have there was 45. So I think 40 is was a nice number to have. Um, but also, I think that's very large for a kibbutz. Yes. And, and tell me, what was your, um, what did you do? So what was your daily routine? What kind of, what, what jobs were, did you do throughout your time there? So for two months, I worked in laundry, which I did not enjoy. <laughs> and then the last two months, I worked in the kitchen, which was so much fun, and I really enjoyed it. So I would wake up about quarter to six in the morning, get dressed in 10 minutes, and then walk to work to be there at six. Then we would work for two hours in the morning and then break at eight for an hour breakfast, which was delicious. And then we would work until one, have an hour lunch, and then usually end between two and three thirty. And then we would go home, have some chill time, and then after that would be dinner. Awesome. And then what would you do? like? Like it sounds like quite mundane, and you know, pretty much what we're doing at the moment. You know, in terms of like lockdown, except you you can actually walk around, uh, and and there's a, a community. But would you um? Like, uh, uh, would you describe it a bit like Groundhog Day or, or um, was it a little bit more exciting than that? It was definitely way more exciting. It sounds very boring, but when you're actually there, it's so exciting. And the people that you get to meet and work with and just the experiences that you get is just amazing. Um, honestly, I thought that the work would be below me and I never thought I'd be working in a kitchen or laundry, but it was so exciting and stuff that I never get to do in my actual life so I'm always you know people are always very like focused on education but then you could actually switch off your brain and just work with your hands and just have fun and just like let go and you know just breathe so that was really nice that I found like you just get so much freedom there and it's just a very very chilled lifestyle I feel like in your actual life you get very worked up about everything and everything's very stressful but there you just go to your job you do it you come home you chill you meet so many new people and it's just a very interesting experience awesome and your living arrangements how would you describe your living arrangements so there were three volunteer houses and there was a top floor and a bottom floor and there were four rooms in each with two bathrooms um 
so there would be two volunteers in each room, maximum three, but that never happened while I was there. Um, some people had double beds. I had a double bed, luckily. <laughs> and then there were shelves in there and a desk or a table or something like that. Some people even had TVs. Um, we had fans. We literally had every, anything we wanted. Um, we had a volunteer kitchen as well and a chill area with couches and TV. And also the Wi-Fi was really good there so we could <laughs> spend time watching this. I was this. just going to ask. Yeah, I was just going to ask, because that's one big question that we got, is like, is there internet? Will I be yeah. able to speak to my parents <laughs> and my friends, you know? Can I connect with the outside world? So, um, yeah, yeah I, I think um, most kibbutzim have, have Wi-Fi. Yeah. Uh, Israel is so technically advanced, it's, it's actually quite scary. Yeah, even on their buses, they have Wi-Fi. So I never actually needed to go buy an Israeli SIM card, because I couldn't just use Wi-Fi. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And my last question, Morgan, is if you, um, if you, if I said to you now, here's a ticket, um, you know, obviously, and, and life was uh, all arranged for you, would you go back and do it all over again? Yes, in a heartbeat. Oh, I, I honestly, I want to go back after my studies because it was just so life changing. And like, I think about it all the time and I talk about it so much. Um, I would honestly <laughs> recommend for everyone to go, like just take a year off and just go there. Um, I honestly wish I spent more time there because I think four months is too short. You need like a minimum of six months, minimum of a year. Um, yeah, definitely. I would go back in a heartbeat. <laughs> Well, that's awesome. Well, maybe the stars will favor you and you can go after your studies. Thank you so yeah. much. I really appreciate it's it. Hang on if you can till the end. Maybe they'll, maybe someone will want to ask you a few questions. Mm -hmm. And then let me see if I can get a hold of um, Amy. Let's have a look. Uh, I did see you somewhere, Amy. There you go. Um, so hi Amy, let me find your slide. Um, Amy, you went last year, if I'm not mistaken, to um, to Israel. Um, yes, I went last year at the beginning of March to Israel. Awesome. I was only... Sorry, yeah. I was just going to ask, how long were you there for, and and why did you um why did you decide to do the program? Um, I was there only for two months. It's not long enough, but it's one of those things. Um, I don't know. Growing up, my dad had always spoken about his time on the kibbutz when he went and after he finished varsity. So um, he had always spoken about it, and. Uh, always had an interest in me and then we see organ um advertising it and yeah i decided to go awesome and what Just was needed a change and and what was your kibbutz called Sorry? and what was your kibbutz called and what um what did they do um it was in the south it was called kibbutz kachura um they did they had a date orchard and a solar farm a hotel and then the org the algae production facility. I think it's <laughs> producing yeah, algae. So yeah, it's so interesting. Um, uh, once again, just Israel shining through in terms of their their first world technology. Um, and and what kind of what jobs did you do? Um, I was in the dining room the whole time, so yeah, cleaning the dining room and putting so that's, the plates. That's a, yeah. I, I remember that to be quite a cushy job, um, <laughs> uh, coming from someone who, who works in the kitchen. And uh, yesterday when we spoke, you mentioned that um, you actually work shifts and that you got quite a few um, uh, weekends off. Is that true? Is, is maybe just explain that a little bit for us. Um, it was every, yeah, so you work shifts. I think you had to do six a week and starting at different times, like every day. Um, and and then it was, you got every Saturday off and then three days a month on top of the Saturdays. Awesome. So That's lovely. You could, and you could get every weekend if you tried to, yeah, I think. Nice. And um, did the kibbutz take you on any kind of trips? Um, we went on one or two hiking trips, as I remember, and a trip to another neighboring kibbutz. Once, I think, got better. We went there two times, I think. And then we went to a lot twice, and then we also did a cooking course in a lot. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. So for mm. for for 
for a two month deal, I mean, you, you got to see quite a bit then, like just, yes. you know, and working and experience the kibbutz itself. That's awesome. And yeah. um, uh, what did I want to ask you is, um, would you, if you had the chance and, and the opportunity, would you go back and, and do it again? Yes, I think I definitely would if I had the opportunity. Um, yeah, try awesome. a different place. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, thanks so much. Is there anything else that you want to share with us? Mm, I just recommend it to everyone. <laughs> awesome. That's so cool. Thank you so much. Uh, and Amy sure. sent us so many photos. Um, it was quite hard to choose which ones to use. Um, so I think that also just goes to show just her love and her enthusiasm for the program. So thanks so much. And if you could also just maybe just stay online, that'd be awesome. Um, and I will, and maybe there'll be a few questions for you as well. Okay, cool. Cool, thanks, love. Thanks. So, um, just in, in, in kind of like a summary in terms of like the benefits of a kibbutz. So we have chatted obviously about the free housing and, and the amazing food and the free meals that you'll be getting as well. Um, included in the actual program itself, is your medical insurance. So it's compulsory for each volunteer to take out the KPC um, uh, 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 kibbutz, we call it the kibbutz insurance. Um, and that is for if in the event, God forbid, something happening to you whilst you're actually working on the program. Um, so that is all included in your program. Like I said, your housing, you're not gonna have to pay anything towards rent or food. Um, you obviously get those free trips. Um, you uh, get your opportunity to be able to extend your program. So um, that is something that we haven't spoken about yet. So the minimum time period on a kibbutz that you need to be able to commit for is at least a minimum of two months. Um, and then you can then extend all the way up to 12 months. So personally, I feel that it's quite a, a really cool and really awesome benefit of the actual program itself because, you know, on all the different programs, I think one of the, the biggest things that hold people back is, um, you know, being able to commit for, for 12 months without knowing really what they're going to be getting themselves into. So with this program, it actually allows you to go and kind of like test the waters and try it out for two months. And then if you like it, you can extend your say. And, and like you heard Karen say earlier, if you are in the north and you wanted to experience a little bit of the south, you want, this is a new concept for us. So you are now then able to request to be able to maybe possibly um, go to a different kibbutz after at least about a three month period, which is really awesome. So um, you probably thinking like, you know, well, isn't Israel one big desert? It's not, there's mountains and you've seen some of the slides, they have snow, there really is snow in Israel. So there is so, there's sea, there's just so much and, and, and more to offer. Um, then just um, in terms of, uh, let me just go to the, the your whole experience. Um, so just remember that obviously your experience is essentially what you make of it. Um, so you really want to go with an open mind um, and it really is all about what you put in and, and what you get out. Hopefully your experience is amazing. I've yet to meet someone who's gone and done the program and said they wish I had never sent them or they had a terrible time. Um, you know, you've got the support of OVC, so we are here to help you from the application process um, to, you know, managing, helping you manage your, your expectations in terms of giving you the information about what a kibbutz is about, etc. So your year is essentially our year. Um, we really like to hear from you guys as well. It, it makes, um, I think, any consultant to dream come true when we receive photos of you actually on the kibbutz. It means that, number one, you've remembered who, who we are, which is awesome, but also that we can actually see you partaking and actually enjoying yourself in your year. So that's, um, it's really nice to have feedback. Um, so I just really, um, almost in closing, just in terms of what is this program going to cost you, you're looking at an average of roughly about 28,000 Rand. That does exclude your spending money. Um, it's quite difficult to say exactly how much spending money you have. I think it depends on how long you're wanting to go for. Um, so I would say if you are thinking on average to maybe go between three to four months, you would want to maybe take a little bit of about 10,000 rand spending money. If your plan is to stay longer than a, or up to about a year and you would like to travel quite a bit, then definitely think and consider in terms of taking more. 
Um, it is a, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting country because it's quite easy to get to and from places. They have a really good bus system. Um, so it really is quite worthwhile. So, you, you know, you've got the kibbutz to use as a base um, and, and obviously to participate on the volunteer program. Um, so, yeah, so all in all, you're looking at about 28,000 rand excluding your spending money which is really not too bad if you consider you know living abroad for 12 months it really makes it uh, when you break it down uh, by 12 months it really makes it really quite affordable um so so like i said in the beginning it really is a very special and a very unique experience i think that if this um, webinar or this um, presentation has somewhat inspired you or uh, created some questions or anything or if it's spoken to you so to speak then uh, definitely you know get in touch with your your local OBC office uh, they will then guide you through the next steps obviously at the moment everything is pretty much on hold because of COVID um, but nevertheless uh, we are very excited and very enthusiastic and very optimistic that it will obviously open up um, we obviously can't tell you when or, or well where, when it's going to open up but it definitely will one day um, but yeah, so now I just really just a thank you and um, if anyone has any questions, you're most welcome to put your mic on um, and, and then you can ask questions or I will also check uh, the chat box to, to have a look to see. Um, let's have a look. Can you travel with friends is, is what is one of the, the questions. Um, so most definitely. Uh, so this is probably a program where um, one of our programs, we don't have very many, which enables you to actually go with friends or sisters or brothers, but it's definitely a program where you would be able to travel in pairs. Um, we recently had a group of guys that went, there was four of them. Um, we often have a request for, for two friends to go. So um, just to keep in mind that it, it could potentially take a little bit longer in terms of placement. Um, so you might have to stay a, a couple of days in Tel Aviv, but that's just um, you're gonna. It's gonna be awesome anyway. Um, but it's definitely something that that you can do as uh, a couple or a, as a as as friends. Any other questions? How long does the application process start? Maybe from a head start. I would say that um, the presentation, the, um, the, the application process, it's really simple and really easy. Obviously, being in lockdown is, is a little bit, um, I mean, you can do everything apart from maybe uh, the doctor's, uh, the medical uh, form, uh, although I know you can still go and actually see a doctor. So um, we just can't yet submit to KPC because we don't know when they're going to be able to start accepting volunteers onto the kibbutz. Uh, kibbutzim. And, um, so uh, I would say it really depends on you. It's a really easy and simple process. It probably would take you like a week to gather all your documents together. Um, and then once we actually submit to KPC, it can take anything between two to four weeks. Um, so we always say try and apply at least a minimum of six weeks prior to departure. Um, which goes by really quickly. And then as soon as your um, application has been submitted to KPC, they will then apply for your volunteer visa. And then once that's been approved, it's, it's, in, it's available for you to be able to depart immediately. So you would be able to literally, you know, book a ticket and, and off you go. Um, hopefully pack a bag somewhere in between um, and, and then arrive in, in uh, Tel Aviv and then take it from there. Um, how many people came with their partners? Or to, oh, okay. Um, the mall wants to know if there's anyone else uh, that's going to Bahram. We have a lot of um, uh, 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 volunteers that actually end up in Bahram, um, which is really quite cool. Are there any other questions? Okay, cool. I'd just like to say thank you to everyone, especially Mo and Karen and Amy and Morgan. Um, you guys are my heroes. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, if you have any other questions, please um, uh, feel free to go through to your OBC office. 
um, and I'm sure they will then be able to assist you. There's one more message. Uh, please explain the whole application process fully with costs step by step. Um, to say to that is something that I think your OVC office will uh, go through with you. Um, I think we'll probably bore people. Um, um, uh, one uh, just if you had to explain it now, but it really is quite easy, quite straightforward. Don't really get too uh, worried about doing things. And obviously, OVC is here to be able to help and guide you. Uh, we have an application email that we're able to guide you through every step of the process. So thank you so much. Much love. Um, take care. Keep safe. And hopefully, uh, well, I won't see you in Israel, but hopefully uh, more and Karen will see you in Tel Aviv. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Bye.